everyone to OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of South Dakota. We are really excited today to welcome Lydia Austin, who is with Custer State Park. She did a program for us earlier this year on caving that absolutely terrified me. <laughs> I can't quit thinking about it. So I know you're going to love this program too. Um, just watching it in speaker view so that you don't have to look at all of the little tiny boxes of people and it'll be easier to see Lydia and especially things that she shows us. So thank you everyone for joining us and Lydia, let's get started. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Thea. Um, as she said, my name is Lydia Austin. I am the interpretive programs manager here at Custer State Park. Um, I have the privilege of working here to, at the visitor centers. Um, I help with programming and also the large events such as the Buffalo Roundup, which is coming up in a couple of weeks here. Um, so I keep pretty busy. Um, I've been here seven years and um, absolutely love this park. Uh, it's been in my family. As many folks in South Dakota, we've traveled here a lot. And so it's just kind of in the blood and it was really neat to come here and work. While I was here, um, I had, I don't know if I would say it's the privilege, but I'm always curious. And so I was working on one of the old buildings, um, started looking through things and I found old boxes of a lot of our historic items. And um, over time I've adapted the park hat of being the uh, archivist. I find a lot of the history that we have lost and we're slowly building up archives here at Custer State Park and learning our history. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we hope to open this up to the public someday as we learn to take care of these items and share these items. Um, and today I was kind of um, excited to be able to share some of the history. Now, Custer State Park has a very rich history. It's very ingrained in South Dakota. I'm not going to touch on half of it, um, folks. If you're interested in it, uh, definitely come out to the park. I'm going to try to get as much as I can, but I could talk for hours probably on the history of the park. So to do that first, though, I'm going to share my screen here. And we'll get going on a PowerPoint presentation here, hopefully. All right, so Custer State Park, um, for folks that don't know, we are located in the Black Hills of South Dakota. This is on the western side of the state. Many folks, when they think of South Dakota, uh, think of the flatlands. Um, we are in the Great Plains um, section, but we do have a very beautiful mountain area, uh, the Black Hills. We are a, a small mountain range on here. Uh, formed through uh, uh, unique geological features, a uh, uh, granite intrusion forced up and kind of caused the ripple effect of the hills. That would be your Black, Black Elk Peak Cathedral Spires area with the layers of rocks going out and it leads to a lot of beautiful formations um, out here. Uh, so to kind of start with the park, we're going to start kind of back with the basic history, not that one yet. Uh, the Black Hills were virtually unknown uh, for a long time as the, the expansion of America moved westward. They had heard rumors of the Black Hills, but they didn't really know what the Black Hills were or what they were involved. As that expansion happened, um, obviously there's gonna be cultural conflicts erupting across, across the Western Great Plains during the 1860s. As the railroads and military posts moved out um, into the traditional hunting grounds, they impacted various tribes out here in the Northern Plains. Restrictions and westward settlements also disturbed things as well. Um, so without a compromise, uh, war was going to occur. Um, so a treaty, a treaty was going to happen in um, April of 1868 there. Um, it became the Fort Laramie Treaty. This is where all the tribes and stuff came together and they were going to figure this out before war could happen. There were 17 articles of agreement and um, with this treaty on here and it covered a lot of things. But one of them is it set aside the Great Sioux Reservation. Um, this reservation is a 26 million acre um, reservation for the absolute and undisturbed use of the Sioux bands. Named the Great Sioux Reservation included land west of the Missouri River, north of the North Platte River, and east of the Bighorn Mountains. So very large tract of land in the center um, of the United States. And as you can see, the Black Hills were located right there um, in the middle of it. Now, with any government document, as I always say when I'm talking about this, there's always the fine print that even though there wasn't supposed to be any folks coming in here, in Article 2 of the Fort Laramie Treaty, it allowed for government officers and agents onto these lands for uh, re um, reconnaissance, learning about the area, and that would happen in 1874 with the Custer Expedition. Custer was asked to come out here and explore the Great Sioux Reservation, do recon, take maps, and learn about the area, and bring the information back um, uh, to the United States. 
This was one of the largest expeditions um, to explore the area. It consisted of more than 1,000 men, over 1,900 horses, 300 cattle, and over 110 wagons. So very large group. They left Fort Abraham Lincoln um, up in North Dakota, came down to the northern part of the Black Hills and explored. They had map makers, they had photographers, um, they also brought geologists and just did a ton of research on the area. They also, uh, as they came through, um, ended up staying down near the town of Custer. Um, there's a big valley here that they camp in. Um, and they stayed here for two weeks and explored um, the area. They actually have pictures of areas in the park. It's kind of cool if you ever go look at it. But along French Creek, they did pan for gold. And they found a little bit of gold, meager amounts. Down here in the southern hills, we don't have the great mines you see in the northern hills. We get a lot of the small flakes down here. But as with any story, when I'm always talking about this, I always say it's like the fisherman's story. When you went fishing, you caught a small fish. But by the time you got home, you got the whopper who broke your fishing pole and it was an ep epic fishing edition. That's what happened with this. By the time word had gotten back to Chicago that they had found gold, they were saying that you could walk horses through the creeks in the Black Hills and the lakes would be covered in gold. You could pick up gold nuggets off the, the ground. It was easy pickings out here. And you have to remember in 1873, 1874, the United States was going through so to hear the news that uh, there was easy money to be made and to get financial crisis, people started flocking to the Black Hills, regardless of the treaty. The first group to come in was going to be the Gordon Party. They came in December of 1874, uh, snuck past the went up north by Bear Butte, down to the northern end of the park, and camped um, on the west side of what is now Custer State Park. We actually have a replica of the, the fort they built in a couple months. And it was 26 men, one woman, one child, and they panned for gold. They found about what today's equivalent of $40, but back then it had been several thousand dollars um, worth of, of finding. So it, it was okay. Um, but the military did find them that spring and brought them back to Fort, uh, Fort Laramie in Wyoming. But they were just the tip of the iceberg. Thousands upon thousands of people started flocking to the Black Hills. The military at first tried to keep them out, but in the end they threw up their hands and there was nothing they could do about it. Um, and so over time, the treaty was negoti renegotiated and South Dakota became a state in 1889. Now, uh, a lot of mining towns did pop up, Custer, Hill City, but once the big mines were found up north in Lead and Deadwood, um, we became virtual ghost towns overnight. So very quiet down here. We turned a lot more towards uh, homesteading, cattle, logging, and things like that in the Southern Hills. We were the supplies that supplied the Northern Hills uh, for mining. Railroads would start happening um, throughout the area. The Mickelson Trail here out in the Black Hills was an old railroad that brought supplies up to Deadwood from Edgemont and such. And so um, we were the supply people. With all of this, though, we also became a tourism area. It happened very early. 1893, we had Sylvan Lake Lodge built up on our northern lake of the park. Um, this was a beautiful Victorian lodge that folks came in. Um, they'd come in on the rail line into Custer and take a stagecoach up to the lodge. And so we started um, uh, going towards that um, tourism. So, so the, we started marketing towards tourism. There we go. My words stopped there for a minute. And um, started bringing folks in. And it wasn't big. I mean, it's still really hard to get here. All the rail lines really went around the Black Hills for the most part because you can't, there's a lot of grades through here. Um, so you'd have to take hot, dusty rides to some of these lodges. But um, Hot Springs was a big one with the Hot Springs. And we, we could attract folks off of there uh, to bring them up. One of those folks, though, was a fateful trip in the early 1900s. It was a gentleman by the name of Peter Norbeck. And he and a group of friends left the town of Pier in a Cadillac and came out and explored the Black Hills, young men who came out here. And Norbeck would end up falling in love with the Black Hills. And it became his personal mission to protect them and to share them with future generations. He would later become a senator of South Dakota and then a governor of South Dakota. And he's actually considered the father of Custer State Park. He is the one who pushed the bill for Custer State Park to become the first state park in South Dakota and actually one of the first state parks um, throughout the country. We, um, a lot of state parks like Texas and Nebraska modeled off what Custer was built as. And so um, we, we have influence throughout the, the United States. Norbeck would come through and what he did is he looked at this track of land and realized he couldn't just have a track of land out here. So he started looking for ways to build a park. And one of the things he noticed that in South Dakota, when we became a state in 1889, we set aside tracts of land in each township, uh, number 16 and number 32. So I've learned a lot about maps, but they're all broken into these squares. And so number 16 and 32 in each township was set aside as school and public lands. So they could build schools on them. 
out here in the Black Hills, we didn't have a ton of schools or anything on this. We had a lot of open lands. We also had a lot of federal lands with the United States Forest Service. And so what Norbeck started to do is he started wheeling and dealing. He would trade ch section 16 and 32 in this one township with section 32 in another township and start building a chunk. So he'd start building these red chunks, maybe trade off blue here and built it up into the 71,000 acre chunk that was in here. Now there were still homesteads and stuff found out through here and throughout the years he would wheel and deal with them and slowly the state would buy them out. In the 1940s, we officially became one full uh, chunk of Custer State Park. We became the Custer State Park game sanctuary in the early 1900s because a state park was hard to sell. People couldn't wrap their brains around it, but they could wrap their brains around a game sanctuary because with all the logging, mining and everything, the animals had taken a huge hit. Deer were very hard to find, bears were extinct, wolves were extinct, elk and everything were gone because they were a food source that was heavily used. Norbeck sold the game sanctuary on the idea that we could bring this wildlife back. And so he built a fence around this and it wasn't all that popular. Um, a lot of people have a hard time with that, especially me. When I started seasonally, you know, you always assume that's Custer State Park. Everyone loves Custer State Park. But back in the time, when you're bringing all this game back that's competing against your cattle and or the fence might break and it gets in with your cattle, it was a hard sell to have the park show up. The government was coming in and putting a big chunk of land in there. And so he had a lot of uphill battles to do, but he, he went through them. But in the early 1900s, we did start bringing that wildlife back. We brought the deer back, we brought elk back from Canada and Yellowstone, and we brought 36 head of bison back from Scotty Phillips and Pierre and started building this up. In 1919, we officially became South Dakota's first state park and um, would continue on to build that throughout time. Still a very quiet area. Um, we, we weren't a huge tourist mecca. Black Hills wasn't on a, a tourist route. For folks going to Yellowstone, they had to come to south and not through um, the Black Hills. So we weren't, we were just kind of that game sanctuary and open land. Normix tried to do it. He could. Um, he built some things, one being the state game lodge. Uh, this was a place originally for the board to meet for meetings that ran the park. Um, and it was the, one of the first lodges here. Sylvan Lake actually wasn't part of the park yet. So this was our first lodge. The original structure still stands. Um, over time, we built wings and stuff on it. Um, but the original structure uh, is still there. Um, and Norbeck would try to advertise the park as much as possible. In, 19, um, in the 1920s, President Calvin Coolidge did come down to visit Custer State Park and used the State Game Lodge as his White House for two weeks. He fell in love with the area and they actually ended up staying the entire summer. Um, it's here in the, um, Rapid City is where he announced he wouldn't run for re-election and such. So a lot happened with that. Um, so like I said, we're still kind of being that small state park in here. And um, Norbeck would try tirelessly to bring those folks in. But a big event would actually have a lot more impact on the park and that would be the stock market crash of 1929. Um, and that would lead us into the, the Great Depression. And a lot of stuff actually happened to the park because of the Great Depression, and it was, it was positive stuff. And that's mainly because of the Civilian Conservation Corps. The CCC or WA projects of the Great Depression had a in, huge influence on any of the parks throughout the country, and Custer State Park and the Black Hills benefited greatly from them. This was a program that employed young men, um, un, young unemployed men throughout the country, brought them out to parks or rec, uh, um, resource areas and they did a ton of work. Here in the park um, itself, one of the big things they did is they did a lot of infrastructure. And so they brought us from this open game um, preserve to more of a park. They built the road, so they started giving us the structures so we could start housing people. They built a museum. The Peter Norbeck Outdoor Education Center was the first park museum here. They built housing for us um, with the Wildlife Station Visitor Center. That was our, our uh, herdsman's housing at the time. Mount Coolidge Fire Tower, Harney Peak Fire Tower, which is on Black Elk Peak. Um, they built the lodges being Legion Lake Lodge up here at the lake. They built Bluebell Lodge and just started giving us that tourism feel um, that would uh, be here. Like I said, they built roads. They did a lot of fire management um, throughout the Black Hills. Custer State Park, like I said, we had four camps here and we just benefited greatly from them um, coming into this area. Um, with that, 
we were, we were set to be that tourist destination. And after World War II, um, that's when folks were looking for those recreational opportunities. They wanted to go out with their families. They wanted to go to the lodges. They wanted to go camping. And Custer State Park saw it. We went from just a couple thousand folks a year um, to where we were starting to hit hundreds of thousands. And by the 1970s, we were starting to hit the 1 million mark for the summer. I mean, if you ever think about this for Custer State Park, we see a majority of our people April to October, and that still stands true today. So families were coming out and they were starting to travel these roads, starting to view the parks, and we were starting to become known as Custer State Park. The famous begging boroughs started making their appearance even back then. Um, that this time we had acquired Sylvan Lake Lodge and they started doing winter sports and ski lodges and the iconic drives. As I always kind of drive the needles in the Iron Mountain Road, I always bring this up. To me, it'd be really cool to take a step back in time and see some of those old classic cars on those roads and just see that drive uh, throughout that time. Um, but as we start becoming popular, we start realizing it's taking a toll on our park. Um, we can't keep up with uh, the, the take on that people need because at this time it was free to enter into the park. You didn't need to have a camping fee and you didn't need to have a park entrance fee. And so people could just come and explore. And in the 1960s, we realized we need to start pulling in an income because we're just hemorrhaging money. And so we start the fee system. It started with a $2 camping fee. Park was still free. You said pay $2 if you were camping in the park, but that would slowly morph into a park entrance sticker um, that still kind of supplies the park today. Um, one of the, the neat things that I always kind of find, I've worked for many land agencies, but here at Custer State Park and in Game Fish and Park, um, all our fees stay within our organization. So all the entrance fees folks buy uh, stay within Game Fish and Park and pay for the park. And we're, we're it allows us to be very self-sufficient, which is just an amazing thing that a lot of agencies don't get that privilege. So it's kind of neat to go through. Um, and so we'd start those park fees and we're, we're again, starting to get big. We, in the 1980s, we hit our 2 million visitors a mark, um, which we see pretty true today. That's kind of the carrying capacity of Custer State Park. We really not haven't gone over that. This year, we're, we're hitting a little bit over it. We've had a record year for visitation, um, but um, we're, we're starting to work up into that. With that too, we start documenting a lot more of our, our natural disasters and natural events. Um, in the 1980s, we had our first largest fire on record that in the time that we knew. It was the 1988 Galena fire, um, started in July from a lightning strike. It burn over 16,000 acres of the park. Had a huge impact on the park because it was July. We had evacuated a lot of guests out of the park. Um, and we learned a lot about firefighting and what we could do. We'd go on to battle the Cicero Peak fire after that. And for the longest time, those two held um, the largest fires in the park. Uh, 2017, we changed that. We would have the Legion Lake fire. Um, that started actually in December of 2017. I have fought a lot of fires in my career. I'll be honest, I have never fought a fire in the wintertime listening to Christmas music on the way to a fire. That was a new experience for me. Um, but that one would burn over 36,000 acres in the park and 52,000 acres of the Black Hills. And that had a huge economic impact on us, um, as well as learning how to protect our wildlife and everything like that. Um, we'd also deal with floods um, and uh, pine beetle epidemics and fires. And over time, it's just molded the park and learning how to protect um, the resources and learn from it. Again, like I said, I've worked for a lot of agencies and what I've always admired about Custer State Park is we're able to learn from each disaster and make it better for the next one. Um, we're not, um, I'm stuck in a tradition or anything like that. So we'd go through with that. This allowed us as we're hitting, um, like I said, we had those disasters, the 18, and 18, 1980s, 1990s, and we start looking into more of how we can um, improve the future. We're still becoming that, that tourist mecca. We're getting a name for ourselves. We're becoming not just a South Dakota destination, but a worldwide destination. And we start looking towards the future. And um, one of those events is we built a new visitor center. Um, the Peter Norbeck Visitor Center used to historically be it. On average, you'd see about 54,000 folks a year. And out of a 2 million person visitation, it wasn't seeing a lot of our visitors we realized it was a hard place to find. Um, so in 2016, we unveiled our new visitor center. Um, that one can see upwards of 300,000 folks during the summertime, so it's hitting a lot more. Um, we're looking at um, uh, the Outdoor Education Center. We turned the Norbeck into the Outdoor Education Center to meet the next generation of park visitors. We learned over time that kids sometimes get scared of the nature, um, just with the way they are with technology and stuff today. Sometimes nature can be scary. So we built an outdoor education center to where they can go get dirty and just learn that nature's fun again. And then we take them on hikes and stuff like that. And so we're just looking at how to promote um, the park for the next generation and keep it as special as it is. 
uh, over time, I've really gotten to know Norbeck and his vision. And one of my favorite quotes from Norbeck is he always said in the end of his talks, you know, if I come back here in 70 to 80 years, I'd like to see the same mountains and the same roads and the same happy faces. And he said he died in a happy man. And I kind of, I, I agree with that. I'd like to come back in 80 or 70 years to see the park as it is um, and meeting those needs of the visitors. So the history is still yet to be written. There's a lot out there and it's a little exciting to see where it's going to go. So, um, so you guys, that's kind of just that brief uh, history of the, the park. Like I said, there's a lot more to it, um, but I could be here for hours kind of telling you that, but I kind of wanted to give you just the basics on there. And um, I have a welcome questions. Um, be warned, I probably could talk a little bit if you do ask questions. Um, if I don't know an answer, I'm really good at making up stories, um, but we'll get it kind of figured out here, so. Lydia, we do have a question um, from Charlotte who wants to know what happened to the Sioux Reservation? Yeah, so, um, and I'm not gonna remember the years on it. They renegotiated the treaty and broke up the Great Sioux Reservations into the reservations you now see in Wyoming, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Nebraska. There was a lot of political pressure on the tribes to sign that treaty, so it probably wasn't politically correct. Um, and I don't wanna put words in folks' mouths, but it, it wasn't probably the best time for it, but it did break it up into the smaller reservations instead of the Great Sioux Reservation. Another question from Anne, do you have problems with mountain lions? That's a great question. Do we have problems with mountain lions? We are home to mountain lions um, here in Custer State Park and the Black Hills. Um, and we have a very healthy population with them. Uh, a number of years ago, Game Fish and Park did start a hunting uh, season on mountain lions in the Black Hills. We have the majority of them collared. So for the most part, we know the number of mountain lions we have in the area. And the hunting season reflects that and allows us to keep it at a normal population. Um, so we usually traditionally don't see them. If you see them, you're pretty lucky. You see a lot more uh, signs of them. I have lived here in the Black Hills and I've probably seen a mountain lion three or four times. And I do a lot of outdoor hiking. Granted, I am with a six-year-old and a nine-year-old who are never quiet, but um, you, you don't see them a ton. So we don't have any um, huge attacks on people or anything like that. Um, you may miss a cat or a dog here or there, but that's that's very rare. It's not like Wyoming, I'm not Wyoming. Uh, Colorado or California who have uh, a little bit more problem with them. I have a question kind of along that line. Um, did they, you talked about uh, all the wildlife that went away during the history of the park because of overhunting and things like that. Um, did they ever successfully bring bears back? Do you think there's bears over there? So that's a great question. Um, the, and I kind of didn't talk about this, but for a long time, we actually had a zoo in the park. In the 1920s to about 1960s, we had a zoo. It's where the new visitor center uh, currently is. And um, that's where a lot of the wildlife would start at before we adapted it to the park. Um, they tried pheasants. Um, that did not work. They tried mountain goats. They stayed in the zoo for three days and escaped. That's why we now have a mountain goat population in the Black Hills. Um, they did try some bears, but they never really wanted the predators out. Um, that was still under the mindset that predators were going to be detrimental to your, your deer and your elk. And so they didn't put um, a bear population out there. Now, we do have bears come through the Black Hills. Um, we'll get folks, uh, not folks, bears transitioning from the big horns of Wyoming, maybe to Minnesota or back. But traditionally, they don't stay. We're not sure why. Um, but the official statement of Game Fisher Park is we do not have a viable population of black bears um, in the Black Hills, but we'll have ones here or there. We did have one early this spring that enjoyed getting fit, uh, photographed, um, so he made his rounds on YouTube quite a bit this spring, but we haven't seen him since. Interesting. Anyone else would like to ask some questions? You can sure take yourself off mute. I'll be watching for you. Anybody, um, if you're on video, you can wave your hand and I'll try to find you on the screen. <laughs> Oh, I'm on mute. Julie, you're not. I, we can hear you. Do you have a question? Oh, <laughs> I have a question. Uh, when is the Buffalo Roundup this year? Great question. So we're going to have the Buffalo Roundup. It's traditionally the last weekend of every, every September. So this year it's September 25th. Um, it starts at 9 in the morning, but our parking lots open up at 6. Um, and I guess a quick thing to tie into that and a little bit of the history of it, the reason we do that is to sell off our surplus animals. 
since we are a fenced in park, we can only sustain so many animals on our grassland for the healthiness of the animal and the healthiness of the grassland. And so we base it off the rainfall and the amount of grass that we have out there and we'll auction off um, animals to keep the herd healthy. This year we're going to auction off about 400 of them. We had a very good uh, calf crop this year, but we started doing that back in the 60s um, just to protect our rangeland and the antelope and the elk and the deer and everyone else who shares the grassland. So now it's become a yearly traditional event. Um, hopefully this year we're working on it. We're going to live stream it on South Dakota Public Broadcasting and another company is coming out to live stream it. So if you can't make it, definitely check out those. We'll be sharing them on our Facebook. We can watch it online as the event happens. I can tell you from personal experience, I've, I used to work for Game Fish and Parks and I've worked it quite a few times. It's one of the last things I think in the United States or maybe even the world where something um, very real and very old can still happen. You feel that buffalo herd run and the ground shakes and it's, it's just as real as it absolutely can be. I encourage people to go out there and experience that at least once in your life. It's an amazing thing. And I'll second that. I mean, I, I've worked it a lot and now I run it and you think it lose that feel and it, it doesn't, it's weird, but, uh, you're up the crack of dawn, it's cold, it's cold on the prairie, and the coyotes are going, the birds are going, and then you hear the buffalo, and it's just a crazy experience. Looks like we might have a couple more questions. Okay. Sure. Um, there's my dad. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Hello, Thea. <laughs> you have a question? <laughs> I do. I'm interested, how did that herd of panhandling donkeys get to be into the park? That's a great question. Yes. So the donkeys, um, the begging burrows down on the southern end of the park, uh, actually what they were is part of Sylvan Lake Lodge. Um, during the early 1920s, they wanted to take folks up Black Elk Peak, which was then Harney Peak. And a lot of the, the folks coming out couldn't hike up that hike. And so they were going to bring folks up by horses. But our governor, Norbeck, said a mule is much more sturdy than a horse. And so they got the burrows. Uh -huh. And um, the burrows would haul people up and down the, the peak. And then when the stock market crashed um, and the, the company went belly up, that's when we acquired Silver Lake, they couldn't um, maintain the burrows. And instead of selling them, they let them go in the park. And we adapted a herd of burrows throughout the park. At one point, they were 200 strong. Um, we have really reduced that number um, to, uh, there's about 15 of them. We had probably about 20 before the Legion Lake fire. Um, we had to put some down because of the fire, and then some couldn't um, have babies anymore because of that, but we felt they had survived such an event. We were never going to get rid of them. They could live their lives out in the park, <laughs> and we've slowly been supplementing the herd a little bit, but we had a good crop this year. We had five foals, and we're doing good. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Gary. Oh, need to take you off mute. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I was just wondering, what is the population of the various animals in the park? That's a good question. I, and I can be close. These are not exact because I don't have a sheet in front of me. But uh, round numbers are going to be about 1,500 bison. Um, normally, we could have about 1,500 bison. We're going to up that a little bit because after the Legion Lake fire, we gained several thousand extra acres of grassland. So we can sustain... Um, a few more animals. And so we're going to um, work with that. We have about 800 elk, about 300 antelope, and then probably about 300 whitetail and mule deers each. Um, and then mountain goats are going to be about 150 mountain goats. They usually tend to stay up, up, up around Mount Rushmore National Memorial or Cathedral Spires area. So those are your rough animals for our rough numbers for our larger animals. None of, another one of our members just asked if there's any wolves there. Great question about the wolves. They're kind of like the bears. We may see one come through here or there, transferring from Yellowstone, pardon me, Yellowstone to Minnesota, but we have not had one stay. Great. Other questions, folks? Everybody going to come visit South Dakota State Parks and go to Custer? It is amazing. And you definitely should. 
Yeah. Yeah. I will say if you come out to the Black Hills, plan on some time. The number one comment we always say is we didn't plan enough time because not only is there Custer State Park out here, there's five national parks um, and three other recreation sites for Game Fish and Park. When Norbeck got us to be a tourist destination, we blossomed. And um, the, it's a beautiful area that you can spend a lot of time at. Definitely. All right. Questions? Well, Thea, I think I'm good. And I'd like to thank you guys again for having me. If you guys do have questions, Thea can shoot them to me and I can answer them um, as we go through. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lydia. And I hope you have a good shoulder season and it's strong out there for you all. I know that this has been a hard year, but keep it going. <laughs> keep those buffalo Thanks. running. It's great to see you and thank you again for joining us. Thanks everybody for joining us, Ali, South Dakota. Um, you can go to our website at uh, www.usd.edu slash Ali, O-L-L-I, and check out all the programs that we have. This is a free program that we've offered nationwide because we feel that Custer State Park is a great place and we just wanna share it with everyone. We do have a lot of classes for our members, for our Ali members. This fall, it's only $80 to join, and you can choose from over 80 classes. So I hope you'll consider taking a look at us, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, if you don't know how to leave the meeting today, look for the red end or red uh, leave button at the bottom at the on the bottom of the right hand side of your screen. And thanks everyone. Have a great week. Thanks, Lydia. Good to see you again. <laughs>